thank you so much. Th thanks for um, inviting me to this great uh, event, and I'm so happy to finally be here and see all of you, and uh, also hi to everybody I cannot see. Uh, so, um, as Dominic said, I'm going to say about perturbation, uh, for renormalization in perturbative AQFT. So, here is the title. I have only four lectures, so uh, there obviously has to be some uh, selection of things. So, uh, first, uh, I will talk about the basics of PAQFT. Then, a bit about classical theory. Then, very, very briefly, about free theory. So, free quantum theory. And finally, the, the, the best and uh, the very important thing about it is the interaction. So, obviously, this is where renormalization comes in. Okay, so let's start with the basics then. So let me tell you, first of all, what's algebraic quantum field theory. So uh, that's uh, most of that abbreviation. So AQFT, that's uh, algebraic quantum field theory. That's an axiomatic approach to quantum field theory. So obviously, well, uh, there are many uh, interesting mathematical structures in quantum field theory. There are many approaches in mathematics and physics to describe it. So this is one of those. So axiomatic approach to QFT. And this being axiomatic, it means that uh, we postulate a bunch of properties that the model should uh, fulfill. And then we see we can construct models uh, that fulfill them. So most of this talk is about constructing models. However, let me first state the actual goal, so the sort of setup in which we are working. Originally, so this is historical remark, uh, algebraic quantum field theory was done on Minkowski space-time, so this was uh, hagen kassler and this was on Minkowski. I assume everybody knows what's Minkowski space term, but if I'm using some terms that you're not familiar with, then please shout uh, here or virtually, or um, I don't know, if there are questions in the chat or if people are asking questions, then please let me know. Uh, I'm happy to interrupt and answer. Uh, so what's the idea? So we have our space term M, so this is the Minkowski space term, we take a region O, which is bounded, and we assign to this A of O, which is the algebra of observables localized in O. Okay, and now if we have two such regions, oh, sorry, that's too much. Let's leave it here. So if we have two regions, so O in O prime, then we want the inclusion of the algebras as well. So A of O is included in A of O prime. Sorry, is it visible in that corner? Is everything okay? All right, okay. Uh, so that's the first property. And of course, I should probably say what is A of O? So what kind of algebra? Well, it, it depends. So we typically want some structure. 
So in the original framework, it was a C-star algebra. So C-star algebra. But in what I'm going to talk about, so in the perturbative framework, this is going to be just some topological uh, star algebra. In fact, uh, more a formal power series in topological star algebras. So formal power series in topological star algebras. Okie doke. I will try not to let it run. Uh, so that's the first axiom, as I said. We have some notion of subsystems. So if we have larger region, we have more observables. Now, another one, this is super important, is causality. Okay, so Minkowski space time comes with a causal structure. So let me draw a picture in two dimensions. So this is the D Minkowski space time. Here is uh, space, here is time. And Minkowski metric, well, looks like this. So we have, let me take my favorite convention. So one at the top minus ones of diagonal, everybody else is zero. So this is metric, okay? And in this metric, this is an indefinite metric. So we have directions uh, which are null, so which are uh, distinguished by saying that um, the vector squared with that metric vanishes and these define a light cone. So we have something we call a light cone. So this is light cone. So this is now directions. So physically this is where light travels. And here we have the passage of time going up the board. So everything here inside the light cone is the future. And everything here is the past. Okay. Now, this is the region that we can um, affect and can be affected by us. But there are also forbidden regions, so there are also things that are happening elsewhere that we have no influence on, okay? So whatever is happening in my department at York right now, I have absolutely no influence on it. So this is that region which is called space-like. And this is also space-like. I'm, I'm referring everything to this origin. So this is space-like to the origin this future to the origin, past to the origin. Okay, so now, uh, as I said, things that happen space-like shouldn't know about each other, shouldn't talk to each other. So causality tells me that if I have two space-like regions, O1 and O2, and this is the notation we use in uh, AQFT to denote space-like regions, is this which kind of looks like a light cone, so space-like, then uh, the corresponding observables should commute, okay? So they should be independent measurements in a way. Okay, so that's causality. All right. Uh, and there is another one that I want to mention, which uh, has something to do with dynamics, which is called the time slice axiom. And here we are. So, if we have a region O, and now we have a Cauchy surface inside it, there is a Cauchy surface. A 
Okay, so uh, Cauchy surface is essentially uh, hypersurface, hypersurface, which is good for posing uh, initial data for hyperbolic problems. So uh, in, well, in general, it's uh, a surface which is um, intersected uh, exactly once by every time lag curve. So if you don't know what the Cauchy surface is, here is a definition. So this is a smooth subspace of M such that then I have to add some adjectives in extendable time lag curve intersects it exactly once. Okay, so uh, I talked about time lag directions. Well, time lag curve is, uh, well then obviously uses that notion. So you think in terms of the tangent vector to the curve, which has to be time lag. Okay, so that's my Cauchy surface. I want to take a neighborhood of a Cauchy surface. So we have this one, this is N. And the time slice axiom says that all the information about the algebra in O is already contained, uh, localized in that neighborhood N. So A of N is isomorphic to a of O. So this is a sort of abstract quantum version of what would be the uh, well posedness of initial value problem in classical theory. So that's the time size axiom. Okay, so uh, we have all the axioms. If you're interested in reading more about it, there's obviously a lot of uh, literature on QFT. So let me just send you to the book of Rudolf Hack, Local Quantum Physics, if you want to find out more. But uh, now we want to go to uh, some generalizations of that. And the first thing I want to generalize is the spacetime itself. So here I had Minkowski spacetime. Now uh, what we do nowadays is to uh, construct things like that on general, uh, more general Lorentzian manifolds. So generalizations Okay, so here we have, for example, the first step. So we do the locally covariant, covariant, a QFT. So here, replace M with a globally hyperbolic space time M. Okay, there is a new term here, globally hyperbolic. Uh, the way I like to think about it is that it has a Cauchy surface. You know what's a Cauchy surface now? So globally hyperbolic is a Lorentzian manifold, smooth Lorentzian manifold that has it. So this means as a Cauchy surface. Excuse my handwriting. Uh, all right, so that we can do. And then uh, instead of taking these bounded regions here, then we take a collection of uh, causally convex regions. So I denote by cos of M, collection of relatively compact 
causally, well, let's start with connected. But everybody knows what that is, I hope. Relatively compact, connected, contractible. So nice regions. And here is the new word, causally convex. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I want this to contain all its causal curves. Uh, and I will say what that is. So this is contains all its causal curves. Okay, and what are these? So causal curves are time-like or null. Okay, so in that picture, the causal curve could be like this, okay, but could also uh, touch this null uh, direction and go off. So these are both examples of causal curves. Okay, uh, so yeah, let me draw another picture to illustrate this convexity situation. It means that if we have two points that are um, contained in my region, that's causally convex. Uh, sorry, that's an A. Um, all the tackles are now visible. Um, right, so we have this region and now a causal curve can go like this but we don't want it to leave the region and go back. So, so that would be violating this condition that it contains all its causal curves. Okay, one can phrase it a bit more carefully, but essentially the idea is that if you have a causal curve that starts and finishes in that region, you don't want it to uh, go for an excursion somewhere else, uh, gather information and come back without telling you. So uh, that's, that's important for consistency. Okay, so this is the family of, uh, well, nice subsets of M that they want to use. Uh, so obviously I'm going to uh, assign algebras to such subsets. So now you have an O here, and you want to look at A of O. Uh, there's another uh, nice thing, so you can actually, uh, formulate this in a more um, abstract way. So you can think of this as a category, if you like such things, and you can then uh, formulate the covariance condition for this assignment uh, that A has to be a functor. So covariance A is a functor to whatever you're working with, so either to C star algebras or these topological star algebras if you are in the perturbative framework. Okay, so that's the quick way of saying it. And then, uh, so, so that deals with covariance, and then you also want to um, impose causality and time slides. So also, Causality and time slice generalize. To such situation. Okay, uh, so that's the setup. I think it's a good a moment for me to erase the boards and let you ask questions if there are questions. So this is the axiomatic set up. Uh, now I want to go to uh, explicit construction. So if you have questions to this, then please go ahead. I have a question uh, so far, yes. Um, about A of O, um, is it uh, 
do, do we have to see it as a space, a kind of space of functions on some uh, on O, or, uh, oh, or, no, or, no. Dist or rather distributions? Yeah, yeah. Well, so it will be actually more like distributions in the end. Yeah. yeah. So in, in explicit construction, it's going to be distributions. But for, for now, we are thinking of it entirely abstractly. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I need to get used to the implements again. And, and you can also think of questions. So Dominic already asked one, so it's not embarrassing. Uh, I can go ahead. Maybe I have a question. Yes. A of O, you already know. Somehow, in the sense, this is the theory you start with, and then you want to realize it as a as a algebraic quantity theory, or? Uh, well, at this point, A of O is a wishful thinking. So A of O is uh, something I'm looking for. I'm looking for uh, this assignment. I'm looking for algebra with these properties. So uh, whatever I find, it has these properties, I would say uh, it's a reasonable uh, algebraic quantum field theory. So what I'm going to do right now is to provide you with some description how to construct A of O and tell you well, why it actually satisfies these uh, axioms. So. So, yes? I think from your observable, uh, you can use, for example, correlation, like measurement, something like that. Yeah. Almost. I need one more thing called the state. So, okay. Uh, okay. yeah. So, so for, for measurement, I want to then construct states on, on this algebra, consider some nice okay. states. So, yeah. And like a measurement part, which is like a plot. Yeah. But, but then there is also a nice measurement theory for this setup, this is due to Fuster and Fett, so they okay. developed a measurement theory in that scheme. So one of the inputs of that is an algebra, like I just said, net of algebras, and the other input is a state, or a class of states of interest. And then you can get numbers, which is good, because you know you want to have those sometimes. Okay, so explicit construction. Okay, so now let's go to something much much more down to earth. I will start with classical theory and then show you how we quantize it, how we renormalize it, how we get A of O. So um, 
Like the very basic thing, first thing you need to. Is it correct? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how it sounds in practice. Uh, okay. I hear myself better, but maybe you also hear me better. I hope you hear me better. All right. So uh, let's start with specifying the space time. So if you want to construct a concrete model, somebody has to tell us what space time. So first piece of input is the space time m. Global time parabolic, of course. And then the next piece of input is uh, what sort of objects you want to study. So what kind of field configurations um, sorry, I have to take a break. Uh, can you help me with this? Because it's, I think it's because I have long hair that this is an issue. <laughs> okay. And all of you. Okay. It's, it's a very, very subtle piece of equipment. Um, I'm not used to that level of subtlety. Okay. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm connected now. Uh, right, so E is the configuration space. So, whatever kind of objects we want to study, <coughs> so the space of fields, you would say. And uh, typically, we want this to be, uh, in practice, a space of sections of some vector model over M. So this is vector model, two sections, right? So for example, for the scalar field, as E just smooth functions on M real values, so that's the real scale. Okay, more notation. Uh, often I will also need compactly supported configuration. So these are smooth compactly supported sections. Okay, so these are compactly supported. And now uh, I also often need just smooth compact disorganized functions for various reasons. So this is the these are smooth compact supported real valued functions on M. And now, so these are my field configurations and my observables. So the elements of A of O are going to be, in the first instance, functions of them. So they're going to be functions of fields. So, uh, observables and let's say first classically are smooth functionals on E. So, this is C infinity of um, E, and let's make them complex value because we are going to need it later. Uh, so, in order to say that statement, I need to maybe say one word about uh, topologies here. So, to make sense of uh, smoothness, I need to make sense of uh, differentiability first, so uh, I have to equip this space with the topology. So this comes with, with a Rache topology. 
And okay, um, there are some references about smooth calculus on such spaces. Uh, I can give you them after the lecture if you're interested. But just to say that uh, there is a very well developed theory of what that means. Uh, but I'm happy to talk about it a little bit more. Okay. So moving on. So that's uh, all fractionals. This for uh, completeness, let me at least give you uh, the definition of the derivative. That's derivative. So uh, the calculus I'm using is Bastiani calculus. Again, I can give you some references later. So the first derivative of a functional f at point i in the direction of psi is defined as the limit t going to 0 of um, 1 over t f of phi plus t psi minus f of phi. So this is the usual directional derivative. And we say also phi here is in E. This is in um, E as well. So we say that f is differentiable, continuously differentiable uh, if um, this derivative seen as a map from E cross E from the corresponding product topology to complex number is continuous. Okay, so that's continuously differentiable, and then you can iterate that definition to get higher derivatives, and then you can end up with saying what it means to be smooth. Now, the consequence of that definition, I mean, there are also other nice consequences, but one nice consequence is that uh, functional derivatives are, um, well, so here you can see that at each point we have uh, a function from E to complex numbers, so we have elements of the dual. Going for higher derivatives, we can uh, deduce that they're all going to be distributions. So distributions are entering the game, finally. So observation. So uh, if we take the nth derivative, at point i, this is a distribution, so it's in the dual of the space of sections of exterior tensor product of the original bundle over m n. So let me describe what these symbols mean. So this is exterior. Answer product. Uh, this means dual. So continuous dual. Okay, so this is a space of distributions, right? So we have distributions. vector value distributions, but still distributions. This is something we more or less know how to handle. So, uh, and we are going to play with these things quite a lot. Okay, so that's the, well, for now, all the functional analytic side of things. What else do we need to know? We need to know how to assign our observables to regions, and for that, we need to be able to localize them somehow in space time. So this is where the notion of support comes in. So a space time support sub f 
of a functional is defined by the following. So we take the space of all points x in m such that for all open neighborhoods u of x let's put it lower so there exists pi and psi so these are configurations or maybe i should say pi is a configuration and psi is a compactly supported configuration such that and this is important uh, so now the functional uh, senses uh, a perturbation which is supported in every such open neighborhood so such that f of pi plus psi minus f of pi is non-zero so in other words right so uh, we look at the regions where the functional is sensitive to field perturbations localized in that region so this is the support uh, okay so one thing i want to do right now i'm going to restrict myself to functionals that are compactly supported so i'm going to keep that for uh, the rest of the lectures so restrict to compactly supported functionals sorry uh, all right um, but that's not everything i need to make further restrictions so there are many things in that space of smooth functionals which are not nice so i want to distinguish things that are nice so here are some important classes of functionals the first one my favorite is local functionals f block this is local functionals okay and what is it so these are the functionals that i mean broadly speaking they can be written as um, integration of a function which depends only on the value of the field at the point and its derivatives so um, so they can be written as follows so f of phi is the integral over the whole space of some function alpha of the finite jet of phi uh, this is the some volume form ah. so this is volume form And this is some smooth function on the jets okay and it has to be compactly supported on m because otherwise i would validate uh, this property so these are local functionals this is the same as one would say local functionals in physics so that's harmless. Okay, and next one. Well, these don't form an algebra, even in a very stupid way. If I want to sort of pointwise multiply two functionals, um, that is leaving that space of local things. 
So uh, algebraically, this is not, well, this is a nice vector space, but that's all. In, in the end, we want algebras, so not happy. Uh, so there is another class, which I denote by just F because I'm using it a lot, multi-local. Functionals. So these are uh, sums of products of locals. Okay, and the good thing about it, it's closed under pointwise multiplication. So this is closed. under pointwise multiplication. So if I take F, G, so the multiplication here uh, is defined as follows. So F times G at point phi, this is F of phi times G of phi. So if we had F local and G local, then this product would be uh, bilocal in practice. And you can have various degrees of multilocality. Okay, and finally, there is another class which I called regular functionals. So F reg, regular functionals. Okay, and regularity here means that these derivatives that in general are compactly supported distributions turn out to be actually uh, compactly supported functions so that they are smooth. Okay, so here the condition is that Fn of phi is in fact the compactly supported section and now we have to be careful we are here we went to the dual, so we have to take the dual of this bundle here. So, the star tensor N over M N, and this here denotes the dual bundle. And this has to hold for all N in n phi configuration. So at each point, all the derivatives have to be smooth. Okay, so that again finishes uh, a natural portion of the lecture. Uh, so I'm going to do more cleaning and, uh, but first, uh, yeah, are there any questions? Yes. Sure. Um in the definition of the support on the yes. phi side, I don't see how u and x compute to f of phi plus phi minus f of phi. Uh, sorry, how, how much you, you? Oh, yes, because, oh, that's a very good, I said that, but you didn't write that. Uh, yes, thank you. This is, uh, this is very good. Uh, so, support psi is in u. Oh. Apologies, yes. <laughs> yeah. Talking and writing, apparently I can do only one thing correctly. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, anything else? Yes? Are there any relations with Weitzman axioms? Um, well, the only relations I'm going to ask for in the end are, are the ones I uh, stated at the beginning, so causality and time size. Uh, no, but, but, but these guys don't have any relations yet. So for now, I'm just taking all the functionals, and you can see, um, you know, derivatives are all the distributions of a particular type. So uh, everything is actually going to be encoded in the algebraic structure, so in products. Uh, so, so these are just uh, plain, uh, pristine without any knowledge of physics. This is like kinematics. You can think of it as, as kinematical structure. And then dynamics uh, 
becomes a next. Okay, any more questions? Besides cleaning. Uh, we started a bit late, but obviously the time is finite, so how, how much time do I have left? Um, so we, <coughs> if, if you stop at uh, 10 past, it's, is it okay? Yeah, yeah, I can. So you have uh, 15 minutes. Okay, great. So I will start the next bit of the story. So let's carry on. And now we can start talking about some dynamics. So that's already the second part, second chapter. So classical dynamics. Okay, uh, so if, if you had classical dynamics in some part of your uh, formal education, this is going to be a bit familiar, but uh, we just make it a bit harder. Uh, so I also teach classical dynamics in York, but uh, don't worry, I'm not teaching that to my undergraduates. Um, but some bits are similar. So we are going to use Lagrangians. Uh, however, uh, we are going to use generalized Lagrangians. So let me first give a definition of generalized Lagrangian. is a map. Okay, so here it goes. From test functions to local functionals such that, and here we have two properties, so the support of L of F is contained in the support of F, so um, this test function, cutoff function governs the support, and now here is a cute thing, so if I take three of such guys, okay, such that the support of F does not intersect the support of H, okay? Then this very nicely splits into three terms. Plus, um, let's put it like, actually, no, sorry minus L of G plus L of G plus H. 
So this property uh, was called additivity in papers by Frenhagen and Brunetti. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, we were told later that it, it's called Hammerstein property in mathematics, so let's call it this way. Uh, and, and make note of this in your head because this kind of uh, relation um, is going to appear also later in other guises. So uh, this way of things, well, things splitting, factorizing, uh, when arguments have disjoint supports is a sort of universal feature of this framework. Okay. Uh, now this, this is just, just a definition, okay? So it tells you nothing. Let, let me show you an example and some motivation. So uh, example, so free scalar field. Because it's his favorite example. Uh, so for the free scalar field, we would take L of F as a function of phi is one half and uh, yeah, signs. Uh, Let's put it like this, minus m i squared, okay? So that's the Lagrangian density as you know it. I multiply it with that test function and integrate with the volume form. So the test function here enters as a sort of cutoff. So this works as a cutoff. And uh, well, there's a good reason for that. So we cannot uh, just put f equals one because our manifold here, the one we are integrating on is non-compact. So this whole expression wouldn't make much sense uh, so that's one reason. Second reason is that going forward, we want these generalized Lagrangians to be our interactions. And uh, again, in uh, epstein glaser renormalization that I'm going to talk about, it's important to consider interactions that are uh, cut off. So uh, part of, of the idea is to first cut off the interaction, so to uh, remove the infrared uh, problem sort of by hand, and then uh, concentrate on solving the UV problem, which is my favorite problem, and then take the adiabatic limit to remove that cutoff. So this cutoff for, for now is, well, a useful device for classical theory, but uh, it's also a good reason to, to have it in the quantum situation. So that's a motivating uh, example. Uh, still have some time. Okay, uh, but it would be really uh, unfortunate if things would depend on that cutoff. So we want to introduce the dynamics, this Lagrangian dynamics, in a way which is independent of that cutoff. Uh, oh, I have the one below. So I want to define the Lagrangian. Euler-Lagrange derivative in such a way that it is independent of that cutoff. So, Euler-Lagrange Euler-Lagrange Make it a little bit higher derivative of L is defined and the following. So I will denote it by DL. So DL at point 
phi in the direction of psi. Now, let me tell you where things belong. So, phi is a configuration. Psi is a compactly supported configuration. And this is defined as taking L at some F, specified in a minute, take derivative, and then evaluate at psi. Now, F has to be chosen in such a way that uh, psi doesn't realize there is a cutoff, put it uh, anthropomorphically. So we have here psi, which has compact support, and then we want to choose F cutoff supported in something larger, such that it's equal one on the support of psi. So this is where F is equal to one. So I can finish the definition where F is identically equal to one on support psi. Definition of the Euler-Lagrange derivative. And because of locality, because L is a local functional, this doesn't depend on F. Yes, Dominique. Uh, okay, for a minute, it's good. Uh, let's see. Ah, okay, let me just say one thing and then I finish. So now we can define the classical equation of motion. Equation of motion. is defined as the condition dl of phi equals zero. So just a couple of comments about this. So uh, dl, I use that notation for a reason. So this is actually a one form on the configuration space. So this condition, this equation of motion is saying that, well, the space of solutions is a zero locus of that form. So, uh, yeah, let me use another one. So, note the space of solutions of solutions that they denote ES for solutions is a zero locus of one form. DL. Okay, so it, again, it's very similar to the classical mechanics situation, only slightly more infinite dimensional. Okay, I think that's the natural breaking point. So. Thank you very much for your attention. Is there any questions? Yeah. I have a question about your definition of Lagrangian. Yes. Okay. Of the, what is G? Why are you quantifying G? G. Oh, there. G and A. They are all, oops, they are all, um, so this is a map from D to F log. So F, G, H are in D. So these are smooth compact. Uh, so, so it's G, this is generic, so it's just whatever G. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So G, yes, G is generic, exactly. exactly. G for generic. Uh, so <laughs> it can, yeah, so the, it, it's a really fun thing that it only depends on F and H. And you can have this for energy. Yes. Concerning the identity. Yes. This is some sort of yeah, generalization of additivity, but why this specific generalization? So there are like a Well, this is exactly what locality is. So so uh, th there is a, well, I mean we're not probably the first one to, to, to do it, but uh, there is a nice paper uh, which uh, well, essentially covers that um, by, um, well, uh, Christian Buda uh, 
get back myself and uh, come in, uh, where we show that this property together with uh, smoothness is essentially equivalent to locality. Okay, so there is a test. Okay. So, so I would say, I would like to make, make a claim that, that this is what abstract notion of locality is, that thing. And uh, in, in the quantum world, you will see uh, an identity like that, but um, where it's not sort of, on the right hand side, you have a multiplicative structure, not additive structure. But again, things split in a similar way. And it's again a uh, signature of locality. So, so my, my understanding of that identity is that it's essentially an abstract notion of locality. Thank you.